Okay, so now we're going to talk about diabetes insipidus, SIADH, which is the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, Addison's disease, and Cushing's disease. First, we're going to start with diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is a disorder of the posterior to pituitary gland. This equals water loss, and it's because there is a deficiency in the antidiuretic hormone or there's an inability of the kidneys to respond to the antidiuretic hormone. So patients that have diabetes insipidus are dying to go to the bathroom because they have a lot of urine. Their urine is going to be very, very diluted and there's going to be a large quantity of urine. So because of the large quantity of urine, they're obviously going to be urinating a lot, but they're also going to be dehydrated because they're getting rid of so much fluid from their body. So these patients are going to have a poor skin turgor. So their skin is going to be not so elastic. They're also going to have dry or cracked mucous membranes. These patients are going to have excessive thirst and that is called polydipsia. Yeah, polydipsia is an increased thirst. Polyuria is increased urination and then polyphagia, which we're not going to really talk about that, but that's increased hunger. But Patients with di diabetes insipidus go to the bathroom a whole lot, so increased urination, so they're going to be dehydrated. They're going to have hypotension because they're getting rid of so much fluid. Their blood pressure is going to go down, so their heart rate is going to go up. So remember, increased urination, decreased heart rate, excuse me, decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate. Let's say that again because I just confused myself. Increased urination decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate. One more time for good measure. Increased urination, decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, if they're getting rid of so much fluid in their body, they're going to have decreased blood pressure because the blood pressure is affected by the fluid volume in their body. Uh, these patients are also going to have weak pulses. They're going to have hemoconcentration, decreased concentrate, de decreased cognition, ataxia, and irritability. Uh, the risk factors for diabetes insipidus can be any kind of trauma to the brain. It could also be because of a bad kidney response, that the kidneys are not responding to the ADH, and some uh, pharmaceuticals can also cause diabetes insipidus. There's three different types. There's neurogenic and nephrogenic. Obviously, neurogenic is going to be dealing with the brain. Nephrogenic is going to be dealing with the kidneys. And then there's also the drug-related. So neurogenic is divided into primary and secondary. Primary mean, being that there's a deficient deficiency of the hypothalamus of the of the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland. Uh, secondary is going to be that there's tumors near the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland, or there's head trauma, there's an infection, the patient has had brain surgery, different things can cause that. That's neurogenic, primary and secondary. Um, nephrogenic is the kidneys are not responding correctly to that ADH, so that's the nephrogenic type of diabetes insipidus. And then the drug-related diabetes insipidus really just works, deals with lithium carbonate, uh, or I can't even say this drug name, so I'm just going to hold it up. It starts with a D. <laughs> it's right there. Hopefully this is going to be in focus for you. But this just de deals with the kidney's response to that ADH hormone. Antidiuretic hormone. I just said it twice. Whatever. Um, so if the patient has a lack of ADH, which is the antidiuretic hormone, that's going to result in a loss of water because they're not holding on to the water. They're increasing their urine output. So for these patients, you're going to assess them for their hydration status because they're at risk for fluid volume deficit. Uh, you're going to take their vital signs. You're going to monitor their serum sodium levels because they can go up with diabetes insipidus. Uh, if they, so the numbers our, our, our teacher was talking about in class, I think it's if they urine, if they urinate more than six liters in 24 hours, that's a cause for concern. Um, urine specific gravity, remember with these patients, it's going to be very diluted. Normal is 1.005 to 1.03. So if it's lower than that, that's diluted. Um, urine osmolality, if it's low, it's diluted. The normal is 300 to 900. I'll put this up here so y'all can see these numbers. 
but just remember that these patients are going to be urinating a lot and it's going to be really really diluted so like imagine like a gallon of water with one drop of kool-aid in it it's going to be really diluted instead of like i don't know i don't know how much you put kool-aid in a gallon of water it might be like a cup other like then there would be more concentrated so these patients are going to have very dilute urine um the drugs for these patients Oh, wait, where did I put it? <laughs> the drugs for these patients include desmopressin acetate, which is DDAVP. This is going to restore that ADH hormone in their body, so their urine output will go down, their pulses will go down, and their blood pressure goes up. Let's do it a little re recap from earlier. They have These patients have increased urine, decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate. So if you're trying to fix that stuff, they will decrease their urine, increase their blood pressure and decrease their heart rate. So that's the goal with this DDAVP is to do those three things. Decrease urine, increase blood pressure, decrease heart rate. Yeah, I got it right. Had to just double check in my head. Um, if the patient is receiving too little DDAVP, there will be no change. They're gonna have that same excess of urination, decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate. If they're receiving too much, the patient can go into fluid overload, which would lead to generalized edema, which could lead to pulmonary edema, which would be crackles and like labored breathing. So you gotta make sure they get the right amount of this medicine so that it's therapeutic for them. Uh, for this patient, they, if they start experiencing like polyuria or polydipsia, so like increased urination or increased thirst, that's gonna be like their body telling them that they need to have a little bit more medicine. So that's something that you need to teach your patient like, hey, if you notice that you're urinating more or you are excessively thirsty, let the doctor know because we're gonna need to adjust your dose. Uh, these patients need to weigh themselves daily. So the same scale, the same clothing, the same location in their house or whatever. If they gain more than 2.2 pounds, which is equivalent to one liter of fluid or one kilogram, they need to call 911. So that's something they need to go to the doctor immediately because they could be going into fluid overload. Uh, water toxicity is another thing that you need to teach your patient. The signs and symptoms of that include a headache, confusion, nausea, and vomiting, and that's another thing that they need to call their doctor or go call 911 immediately because that's an emergency. Uh, the patients, we talked about this in class as well, they need to drink fluids equal to the amount that they are outputting. So if they're outputting three liters a day, they need to be drinking three liters a day because they are at risk for dehydration. These patients are going to need these medicines for life, so they need to be taking DDAVP for life. And remember, they need to get that therapeutic range where it's not too little and not too much that they are maintaining it correctly. So another thing just for these patients is you're not restricting the amount of water that they intake. You don't need to like do a strict INO thing. You just, you need to know what they're outputting so you know what they need to be inputting as well. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is SIADH, which is the syndrome of in inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. This deals with the uh, vasopressin ADH that's secreted even when plasma osmolality is low or normal. So this is gonna be disturbing the fluid and electrolyte balance. So water is retained, the patient therefore go, their whatever term I wanna use, I can't say it, I think I wanna say therefore, therefore it goes into fluid overload, which equals hyponatremia. So let's say that again. Vasopressin, which is ADH, the antidiuretic hormone, is secreted even when plasma osmolarity is low or normal. So because of that secretion, it's gonna disturb the fluid and electrolyte balance. Since the fluid and electrolyte balance is disturbed, water is retained. Because water is retained, the salt that's in the body is gonna be diluted. So hyponatremia. Hyponatremia, and since the water is being retained, is gonna equal fluid overload. So, since there's fluid overload, the patient is going to have increased blood volume, volume, which is going to increase kidney filtration, which is going to increase urine sodium loss, and these things inhibit the release of renin and aldosterone. So, since we have all these issues with water and salt, let's talk about the symptoms. First of all, these patients are going to be water retentive retention retaining water retaining i can't use words these patients are going to be water retaining and they're going to be hyponatremic so low sodium volumes 
So, since they have low sodium, they are going to possibly have a loss of appetite. That does not correlate, but that, I don't know how to have a little segue there. Let's just start with their symptoms again. Water retention, hyponatremia, loss of appetite and weight gain, increased blood pressure, increased pulse, decreased body temperature, nausea and vomiting, lethargy, headaches, hostility, disorientation, changes in level of consciousness, decreased tendon and uh, tendon reflexes, uh, seizures and comas, and they could have a bounding pulse because of the increased fluid. So let's kind of bring those things together. If they have water retention, they're holding onto water, they're gonna have an increased blood pressure because they have that increased fluid in their body. Because of that, their pulses are gonna be bounding. Because of that, they, I mean, if you've got all that extra water in your body, you're probably not gonna feel that great. You might feel like not being nauseous or throwing up or whatever. You could also be lethargic because you're tired. And I don't know. I'm trying to bring these things together, but I don't know if that's going to work. Also, because of water retention, you're going to be gaining weight. So those things correlate. With hyponatremia, if you're hyponatremic, you're most likely hyperkalemic because salt and potassium are inverse of each other. So there's going to be issues with, uh, well, there would be issues with your heart. We already talked about your heart. But I could see that your patient would be disoriented or having changes changes in their level of consciousness. But someone's probably going to get in the comments and say, you're wrong. But I'm just trying to bring these things together. Just know that your patient's going to be lethargic, have a headache, increase blood pressure, increase pulse, decrease body temperature, um, water retaining, and hyponatremic. So just focus on that. Uh, risk factors for SIADH are some cancers, a pulmonary infection, or some type of pulmonary impairment. There's some SSRIs, like an antidepressant that could cause this. And then other CNS di disorders like trauma, if they have a stroke, if they have a tumor in the brain, or if they have lupus. Um, when you evaluate this patient, you're going to see that they have low serum sodium levels because the fluid dilutes it. They're going to have low plasma or serum osmolality. They're going to have a high urine specific gravity and urine osmolality because the urine is concentrated. Uh, for these patients, you do want to restore uh, the fluid balance, so you're going to be restricting intake. So, I mean, if they need to take their medicine, you need to take it with the smallest amount of water possible. Uh, for these patient, patients, when you assess them, you need to assess them for any recent head trauma because that's a risk factor. If they have a cerebrovascular disease, if they've had tuberculosis or any other pulmonary disease, or if they have cancer. For the drugs that we're going to be treating this, because the... Um, Vasopressin, which is ADH, is low or normal. You need to supplement that. You need wait. You need to have vasopressin receptor antagonists, like tolvaptin or conovaptin, which is okay for patients that have low sodium values. So I hope that's making sense. I don't know. There's so much here that you need to know. It's kind of hard. Um, so for SIADH, the drug of choice are vasopressin receptor antagonists. These are Vaptins, which are Tolvaptin and Conovaptin. Those two drugs in particular are good for patients that have low sodium. If your patient has sodium that's normal, you can give them furosemide, which is a diuretic, which is, help, which is going to help get rid of some of that extra water because furosemide is going to get rid of the water and extra sodium, while the Vaptans are just going to get rid of the water. They're not going to get rid of the sodium. Uh, if you have a patient that has really low sodium, you can give them 3% sodium chloride, which is a hypertonic solution, but you only can give this to the patient if they have no history of heart failure. So for these patients, you need to ha monitor their fluid status. So you need to do a strict INO, fluid re uh, restriction, so less than 500 mils total in the day that they can drink, you need to monitor their neurological status and you also need to prevent like overstimulation. So put them on seizure precautions and don't stimulate them a lot, I guess. Uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about is Addison's disease. Addison's disease occurs when there's adrenal insufficiency, which is the adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. Um, for these patients, the risk factors include like if they've abruptly stopped taking steroids really quickly, but there's 
two different ways that they could get Addison's disease. Uh, two different types, I mean. There's two different types of Addison's disease. There's primary and secondary. Primary occurs with like autoimmune diseases or tuberculosis. Uh, some metastatic cancers, uh, if they have AIDS, which would be another immune, like autoimmune disease. Hemorrhages, gram negative sepsis. Uh, they say adrenalectomy, so if they have their adrenal gland removed, and abdominal radiation. Some drugs and toxins like mitotin can cause Addison's disease. And then secondary is going to be because of like tumors or things directly occurring to the pituitary gland. If they have postpartum pituitary necrosis, hypophysectomy, which I don't really know what that is, but that's something that can cause secondary Addison's disease. If they stop long-term use of corticosteroids, so that's what we were talking about earlier with the risk factor, or if they have high-dose pituitary or whole brain radiation. So things that are directly acting on it, that's going to cause secondary Addison's disease. Patients who have Addison's disease are going to be lethargic, have fatigue and muscle weakness. They'll have salt cravings, so I want you to remember that. GI issues that include anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, abdominal pain, hyperactive bowel sounds. They'll be dehydrated, dehydrated so they'll have decreased skin turgor, weight loss, menstrual changes, vitiligo, or hyperpigmentation. They'll have decreased blood pressure. These patients will also have decreased libido. They'll be hyponatremic, so low salt, hyperkalemic, high potassium, hypercalcemic, which is high calcium, and they'll also possibly have dysrhythmias, which is really related to the potassium levels that are high. So for these patients, I want you to think of, um, there was a patient, there, not a patient, there was a character on Grey's Anatomy called Addison Montgomery, uh, Montgomery Shepherd at one point, but whatever. The, there was a doctor on uh, Grey's Anatomy named Addison, and I always like to think of her it's kind of like salty, like you know how like she's like just kind of like bitter and like just jealous and like mad kind of all the time. She, Addison's disease, patients who have Addison's disease have salt cravings. And Addison, the character, was quite skinny so she could have weight loss. I'm thinking she could have a decreased libido, which would be very odd for a patient, for a character on Grey's Anatomy, but we're going to go with it in our brain here. Uh, I could also think of her being weak because she was quite skinny and she didn't seem to work out so she could have muscle weakness and fatigue. So I just try to associate like these different symptoms since it's called Addison's disease. I like to think of her as like a salty character that is quite skinny because of the weight loss. She has a decreased libido. She's got, uh, what is it? Menstrual changes? Who knows? I don't know. I mean, I'm just making these things up in my head. But I'm just kind of applying it to her because she was quite of a salty character on the show, in my opinion. Uh, so there are different things that you can assess for your patient. Fluid balance being the first thing. You also want to monitor their heart because of that increased potassium level. So you want to put a heart monitor on your patient. Take a medication history. You want to ask them if have they been on any long-term steroid use and have they stopped it suddenly. And you also want to watch for any signs of Cushing's disease because if they're getting too much steroid as their treatment, then they could go into Cushing's disease. Uh, for evaluation, when you look at these patients, like when you look at their uh, CBCs and stuff, they will have a decreased cortisol level, decreased fasting blood glucose because of the cortisol, decreased sodium, increased potassium, increased bun, increased eosinophil, eosinophil count increased ACTH and the uh, in the primary disease specifically the increased eosinophil count and the increased ACTH will be in the primary disease so for these drugs the for the this disease the treatment for drugs would be hormone replacement therapy this could include prednisone or fluoro fludrocortisone uh, it just depends on if the doctor wants to do a glucocorticoid replacement or mineral corticoid replacement. There's different pros and cons to each one. Um, you don't want to have a salt restriction and you don't want to give them diuretics because that could lead to an adrenal crisis. Typically, they want to give the patients two-thirds of their dose in the morning with one-third at night to kind of mimic that natural high and low fall of cortisol that's normal in the body. Uh, the patient may need to have their dose increased if they're experiencing a lot of stress or if they 
increase their activity level or if they get sick, so they need to talk to their doctor about that. You want to watch for hypertension if they're getting that fludrocortisone drug. Uh, if the patient starts having an Addisonian crisis, which sounds so serious, the Addisonian crisis, uh, this patient can go into shock. So the the goal is to replace the cortisol and the fluids in their body. But the very first thing, when you talked about this too in class, like it was a big deal. The very first thing, if your patient is having an Addisonian crisis, the first thing you want to do is you want to replace their fluids because they're dehydrated and you can't fix a dead person. So you need to give them their fluids first. So fluids first. Second, you want to replace the cortisol that they've lost, so cortisol replacement. Third, you want to get them on a heart monitor. Now, we kind of talked about this too. We could like multitask here, like I'm going to start the fluids and I'll say, push the call light, hey, so-and-so, you can put the heart monitor on this patient. Like a lot of this stuff can be going on at the same time, but if you think like, what is the one thing I can do as the nurse? The one thing you can do as the nurse is to start fluids, so get fluids going. So we have fluids, which we specifically said D5, N5, rapid infusion, which I forgot specifically what it was, but it was like dextrose, uh, normal saline, because they also have low sugars. So fluids, then the cortisol replacement, then get them a heart monitor. And then the last thing that you could do is either give them insulin or glucagon if needed. You may give them their insulin if their potassium stays high. You may give them glucagon if their glucose stays low. It just kind of depends. You got to kind of watch your patient and see what you need to do. But the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to start fluids. Then you're going to replace the cortisol. And then you're going to do the heart monitor. So those are all the different things for Addison's disease. Uh, the next disease we're going to talk about is Cushing's disease. This is an excess of cortisol because of an over secretion of the anterior, anterior pituitary gland of ACTH and this can cause hyperplasia of the of the adrenal cortex. So there's different risk factors including pituitary adenoma. Uh, women have an increased risk of this and if patients have a chronic use of exogenous corticosteroids like chronic inflammatory conditions, those patients have an increased risk of this. There's three different types. There's pituitary Cushing's disease, adrenal Cushing's disease, which is normally called primary Cushing's, and then syndrome, which is secondary Cushing's disease. So with pituitary Cushing's disease, it's where the pituitary gland is the problem. With adrenal, the problem is with the adrenal cortex. It's usually a tumor or something going, along, going on there. With the syndrome, it's from like a drug therapy or another health problem. So this is the, set, the one that's called secondary. So the symptoms for this one is the patients are... Our, our, our teacher actually showed us a picture and it was like, okay, yeah, you can kind of tell. The patients have like a really round moon face. They typically could have a buffalo hump. They've gained a lot of weight. They have increased appetite. They're depressed, most likely because of the increased weight gain in the moon face and the buffalo hump. They have hypertension. They have decreased immunity. They're insomniac. Well, they're, they, they suffer from insomnia. They have weakness, osteoporosis, which is common with hypercortisol syndromes, hirsutism where they get like excess facial hair, especially in women. Um, women will stop menstruating. They could have GI issues like ulcers. They could have bruising or petechiae, which are like those little red uh, dots. I don't, I mean, it's kind of like a broken blood vessel, but it's just like little red dots on their body. Um, they could have truncal ob obesity, so like the abdomen is going to be really large, but their extremities are going to be really, really skinny. Uh, patients can also have edema and then striae, which are stretch marks. These patients will also have increased blood pressure, increased temperature, increased respirations. Uh, these patients will have thin skin. They'll have labile mood swings, so go from really, really happy to really, really sad really, really quickly. Um, when you assess these patients, you need to assess them, like you need to talk to them, ask them about their mood swings, ask them if they've had any difficulty sleeping, um, poor wound healing and thin skin, if they've noticed that they've started bruising more easily, bone density loss, if they have osteoporosis. Uh, you can evaluate these patients by looking at the cortisol levels in their blood, saliva, and urine. You can look and see if they have an increased blood glucose level, which they typically would decreased lymphocyte count which relates back to the decreased immunity, increased sodium because of the hyperaldosterone that's going on, the decreased calcium and decreased potassium, and 
if you take a CT scan of their abdomen, it could show like a tumor on their adrenal glands. So that's just like another diagnostic thing that's going on. Uh, for these patients, there's different drugs that you can offer that all decrease the cortisol production. I'm just gonna show them to you because I will never be able to say these words. Lord knows I butcher everything, but those are the ones that decrease cortisol production. Um, this one, the next one is mitotane. That's an adrenocytotoxic agent. My Preston blocks the glucocorticoid receptor, so they all work a little bit differently, but they're all kind of doing the same thing where they want to slow down the secretion of that uh, the cortisol. So there are also some surgeries that can go on for these patients. We talked about these yesterday and we were like, whoa, like you never really think about some of these things until like your teacher says, well, that's something that you have to consider with this type of thing. Uh, there's this drug, there's a surgery called the hy hypophysectomy, which they do like an incision in the mouth and they're able to directly access the pituitary gland that way. And they're able to manipulate and do whatever they need to do and remove whatever they need to remove. But it, they, they put like a muscle graft from, I think our teacher said like their leg in the top of their mouth and they'll have nasal packing, but there's things that you need to teach your patients like, Hey, when you get out of surgery, your nose is going to be stopped up and you can't brush your teeth and you can't lean forward. And like, there's all these different things that it's like, okay, well, obviously you don't want them to blow their nose or cough or sneeze or use a toothbrush that could irritate that uh, surgical wound. Just different nursing implications that you need to teach your patient. Um, for these patients, you need to monitor their INO to watch their fluid balance because they're at risk for diabetes insipidus. You need to watch out for their neurostatus. You need to watch for the prevention of complications, especially with patients that have this surgery here, the hypophysectomy, because that infection could lead to meningitis in the brain. So if they start complaining of like a high fever or a stiff neck, like take note. Um, you need to give them stool softener so that they're not straining so that they don't like burst their surgery, their wound. And drainage from this, like from underneath their nose, should be serosanguinous, so like a little bit clear and a little bit bloody. It shouldn't be straight blood and it shouldn't be straight clear because if it's straight blood, that's a hemorrhage. If it's straight clear, that could be cerebrospinal fluid. Like it shouldn't be either of those. It just it should kind of be a little bit of a mix. Um, there's another surgery called an adrenalectomy where it's, I'm assuming they had removed the adrenal glands because it's adrenal and an ectomy. Uh, for this one, you need to give them glucocorticoids preoptively. Is that even a term preoptively? I guess it is. I'm going to say it is now. Um, monitor their electrolyte levels like their potassium and sodium, heart monitoring, monitor their blood glucose levels to prevent hyperglycemia. Give them a high protein diet because this is going to help them recover faster after surgery and postoperatively they're going to be on a hormone replacement uh, therapy. So for this patient who just has Cushing's disease, we're not going to talk about their surgeries anymore, but the patient who has Cushing's disease, a primary intervention is that you're going to want to help them prevent injuries. One, they have decreased immunity, so decreased wound healing. Two, they have osteoporosis or they could have osteoporosis because their blood calcium level is out of whack. And three, they have thin skin and bru easily bruising. So you want to help them prevent injuries by like patting any bony promin prominences, having them take extra care. If you need to move a patient that has Cushing's disease, use the draw sheet method so you don't have to pull them directly over a sheet using paper tape uh, on any uh, gauze or wounds or whatever that they have, uh, turning them every two hours, just different protocols to help prevent injury to these patients. Uh, give them any drugs to prevent GI issues like antacids, monitor them for infection, uh, watch for fluid overload, increase protein in their nutrition so that they can start getting back the whole, like getting back their immunity and wound healing capability and give them emotional support because of their appearance. They just tell them like, this is temporary. This is just like a little disease that you have. We can fix this. Like, I know you have a buffalo hump and a moon face, but once we correct this, that should go away. So hopefully this helps. I think it's just kind of me rambling about, but I don't know. Hopefully this helps.